first of all, you have to think about what do you need to know. And the answer to that depends on what happened and what stage after the events are you arriving on the scene to gather information. In the first days, we need to know if people are alive or dead, where they are, and if they are suffering risks that could kill more people. Until we know this, we don't really need to know details about housing, protection, food and health. But we do need to know those things as soon as we know what the conditions of life or death are for a lot of people. We have model stages, one, two, three, and four, after a disaster. Stage one is the first three days, stage two is the first two weeks, more or less. Of course, the stages, these is a, this is an idealized view. In reality, nothing switches from stage one to stage two on the ground. It's an evolution. And the evolution can be faster or slower depending on the conditions and the scale of the disaster. So I can't ever say precisely, but basically in stage one, you need to get people on the ground to look around just look around, observe what's going on, ask whoever you happen to find in different places what's happening, and collect and summarize that information. That doesn't require a questionnaire. What it should involve is filling out a one-page or maybe two-page summary so that you can compare the impressions of different people in different places. But when we talk about a survey, we're usually talking about households, you're usually talking about finding the head of the household or the female head of the household. And we shouldn't be doing that in the first couple of weeks. We have to have better information about the emergency needs before it's worth doing that. So stages are important, but they're not rigid. And you have to look around and listen to know just what's needed first and then what's needed second. The gathering of information from people who are affected by disasters goes from qualitative in the first stage of this is what I see, this is my impression, to on the other end of the scale, after a month or two or three have gone by, qualitative where we're filling out questionnaires, we may be weighing children, we may be um, counting food or square feet in homes per people. The more measurable things are, the more quantitative they are. But things don't fall into categories of qualitative and quantitative. It's a continuum there as well. So your first impression is things are bad. Needs are great. Your second impression, a little more quantitative and a little less qualitative, is in three communities they had food, in five communities they didn't. Many places I went to, people had shelter, but it wasn't very good shelter. They had makeshift shelter that they had put together because they weren't in their homes. Now you're getting into sectors and you're saying this more than that. Well, a little, some, a lot, extreme. That's not quantitative, but it's not qualitative either. It's somewhere in the middle. It's systematizing impressions so that they can be gathered from different people and summarized according to the time period, the geographic area, and then you know something. That's where we've added value. Rather than just everybody coming and sharing their impressions, we can say, in this zone, this is the bigger issue. In this zone right now, it seems to be this one. Or over the last two weeks, things have switched from the problem of getting dry and getting shelter to people are mainly concerned now with reestablishing productivity and getting back to farming. If you can identify those things qualitatively over time, you've learned a lot that's useful. And then we'll know better what to ask in detail and measure. So remember, everything that you can observe can be summarized. And every summarization can be pushed one step toward the quantitative. At least making an order between small and large or primary concern and secondary concern. And then asking, between these two concerns, which one is the first? It's qualitative information, but it's not just qualitative. It also means that since we've moved a little bit toward the quantitative, it's more comparable from one place to another. Almost everything we want to know, we want to know it in comparison. Comparison 
to other groups of women in other parts of the country, or comparison to a group of men that I can sit down with here and have a conversation with, or comparison over time. All of these comparisons give us a chance to say, what does this information mean now to these people? Your job is to give voice to people. That means to systematize the information and put it in a context. And the best contexts are this group compared to that group, this place compared to that place, these people with this economic level compared to these people with this economic level, and always after a disaster, these people compared to how they were before. So if you're asking about something, it takes very little effort to say, well, for example, um, how is security in this area? Do you feel safe or not? No, we don't feel very safe. Men are attacking. Uh, our women are, are, uh, have been attacked and we're worried about losing our goods, uh, our farm has been robbed, whatever it is. Those responses are important to know what the nature of insecurity is to them. Because I don't know just by saying, are you secure or insecure? But as soon as you found out about this, ask, and how was it just before the earthquake? Or how was it just before the government fell? Uh, because if they say, well, it's, it was insecure before and it's insecure now, just the same. That's very different from, we didn't see this problem very often, and now we're seeing it every second or third day. That gives the information a, comp a context, a comparison, so that you can more effectively give people voice.